All of you, okay, apology is going to be boring <laughs> because uh, it will be very repetitive for some of you. Uh, I'm Arya Sharma, I'm the uh, medical director of the Provincial Obesity Program and uh, I'm very excited about the kickoff of this uh, project because you know, we have the Weight Vice Clinic and there's you know, lots of specialty care going on. Okay, having said that, um, in your white packages that you have, I want you to open up those and for now just take out one item and that's, a, that's the little pamphlet. That's this little booklet. Found this? The other stuff you can put back in, in the envelope. We won't need it for now. Uh, this booklet, everything that's in this booklet, all the slides that I'm going to show you in my talk are actually taken straight from this booklet. So you don't have to make any kinds of notes while I'm speaking. Uh, if you want to make notes, you might even want to make those notes in the booklet because they're pretty much uh, everything I'm going to talk about. It looks slightly differently on uh, it looks slightly different on the slide, but the content is exactly the same. Okay. I want to talk about the key principles of obesity management. I'll give you a little bit of a background how they developed, uh, what they mean, uh, and then I'll give you an overview of the five obesity management, which is really what this project is about. Uh, we might not have time today to go into each one of the five A's in detail, uh, and one of the things that we probably need to do. Uh, as part of the learning collaborative, uh, if that's what you think is important, uh, is probably after today take a step-by-step -step approach and go through each one of those A's and in fact actually each, each of the sub-bullets of the A's you could spend hours talking about each one, one of those aspects. Uh, we won't have time to that for that today. So today's a broad overview of what the five A's are and how uh, they're supposed to work. So a little bit of background on the, on the project. So, so my own background is in nephrology. I trained as an, in general internal medicine. I've worked in specialty care, academic medicine pretty much all my life. Uh, a lot of it, chronic disease management. And about 20 years ago, so I started having an interest in obesity. And I came into obesity thinking that this was just a simple thing of you know, getting people to eat healthier and get more active, exercise, calories in, calories out. Um, and then I had to realize that it's not that simple. Uh, and I you know, sometimes joke about this, I say, you know, telling someone with obesity to eat less uh, is about as effective as telling someone with depression to cheer up. Uh, it just doesn't work. And uh, one of the reasons perhaps why a lot of the approaches that we've used in the past have really not worked is because we've tended to think of obesity as being a, being a single entity. Uh, when in fact, there are many, many types of obesities. Uh, when you have people who have excess weight, of course they all have excess body fat, that's you know, adiposity is. Uh, but when you look at the molecular structure of that, it's different. When you look at the location of the fat, it's different. When you look at cell sizes, there are some people who have very small fat cells and some people who have very large fat cells. Uh, when you look at where the fat is deposited, some people tend to put a lot of their fat inside their abdomen, some people put a lot of their fat on their thighs and their hips. Uh, and then we've also come to think of obesity, uh, of fat tissue itself really as an endocrine organ. This is a very complex organ, it's a very heterogeneous organ. Uh, it secretes a lot of different molecules that have a lot of bodily functions that can affect everything from puberty to, to immune function, to appetite, to energy metabolism. It's a very complex organ. And uh, apart from the fact that fat tissue itself is very heterogeneous, when you look at the many ways that people actually end up gaining weight, you can start off with childhood obesity that's large in genetics, uh, where you have people being born with certain genetic traits and right off the bat, you know, they, they, they struggle right from, from childhood. Uh, to adult onset obesity, which happens to people later in life, and there's many, many reasons for that. Uh, and that diversity, is important in managing. So, so the reason that somebody gains weight uh, can be very, very different amongst very different people. The impact that, that excess weight can have on their actual health will be very heterogeneous. You can easily find two people, they have the exact same amount of body fat and yet one person has got all kinds of health problems, the other person is relatively fit, relatively healthy. Um, but finally, and, and, and that's probably as important, uh, and, and part of why our approaches have not really 
uh, been as effective as they could be is that the responses to treatment are extremely heterogeneous. You can take two people and you can put them on the exact same diet, you can give them the same number of calories, you can do the same kind of bariatric surgery, you can do it in the same clinic, same setting, same doctor, same staff, and yet you'll find wide variations in response. You'll find some people going off losing a lot of weight, doing great, and some people struggling, and perhaps even some people gaining weight with exactly the same approach, the same situation. So you've got a condition that's highly heterogeneous, uh, etiology is different, impact on health is different, and response to treatment is, is, is different. So really we should stop thinking of obesity as a, as a single condition. It's a whole range of things. Uh, so gradually I think I've come to understand that, and that has very much shaped my thinking in our approach to, to addressing obesity. So the Firebase project came about, uh, it was funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada and uh, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and it was really a two-year project where the idea was to say what is currently happening in primary care and obesity management and what needs to change. And so the first part of the Firebase project was really very much focused on you know, doing practice interviews, uh, talking to the experts, seeing what's the evidence out there, what, what, what do the guidelines recommend, uh, and what is actually happening. And that included patient interviews, patient surveys, and essentially what we found was that there's a lot of things happening, but very little of it seems to be effective. Uh, there's a lot of frustration with obesity management that this is really not going anywhere. Uh, patients are very frustrated. In fact, patients are so frustrated that in many cases they will not even bring up the topic. They don't even see their health professional as the person to go to uh, when they have a weight problem. They'll rather go to some commercial weight loss program or they'll watch Doc Dr. Oz or something. So, uh, so, so they don't even see this as a medical condition that requires medical help. Uh, and when you look at uh, the effectiveness of what actually happens in those interventions, there's a lot of frustration on both sides. The patients are very frustrated, this is really not working, it's not helping, I'm not losing weight. Practitioners are very frustrated saying this is a, not a good use of my time, I don't seem to be having any impact and I could be doing other things. Uh, and so that's, that's pretty much the status quo uh, with variations um, you know, across settings. And so the first part of the project uh, was to try to figure out what is actually going on. That was followed by a second step, and that step was then to say, well, okay, so if it's not working, what is it that we need to do differently? Or what is it that we need to, or, or how do we need to think differently about the problem? New solutions. Like what are the key things that we need to change in our understanding of obesity based on the latest evidence, latest science, that will start moving us in a direction where hopefully there's going to be an impact. And so the, so the second part of the project was, again, trying to distill those principles, those, those basic, fundamental, you could say almost philosophical ideas about obesity that would shape the entire program. And what I'll share with you now are those five principles, and you'll see them in your booklets as the key principles of obesity management. The first one that emerged here is really the idea that a lot of people struggle with and that is the whole concept of obesity being a chronic condition. The definition of a chronic condition in this case being that this is a condition that we don't know how to cure. Like a lot of chronic conditions. Uh, we've got a lot of conditions out there that are pretty much, once you have the diagnosis, it's pretty much a lifelong condition. I mean, there's a million chronic conditions that all require lifelong treatment because they are not conditions that we can cure. And obesity is just like that. And the reason that I say we cannot cure obesity is because everybody that we know, and we, we all know people who've lost weight and who are keeping weight off, and some people have lost large amounts of weight and they're keeping off those large amounts of weight, you would not consider them to be cured because all of these people are constantly, every day, doing something to sustain their weight loss. And there's quite a bit of evidence on what it is that these people do, and that perhaps could be an interesting topic. Uh, to talk about what, what do we know about people who've lost weight and are keeping it off? What's different amongst, or, or what are these people doing differently from everybody else? Because the data tells you that for out of 20 people who's going to a diet and exercise program or try losing weight on their own, 19 of those 20 people will put the weight back on within two or three years. And by the time you get to four years, five years out, most people who've lost weight are back to where they were before. So when you meet somebody who's lost 50 pounds and is keeping it off for five years, that is a very exceptional person. That is not the normal person who 
uh, is like everybody else, right? So that person must be doing something special and there might be learnings there. Uh, but very often that person might be doing something that really we can't expect the other 19 to do, which means they'll never have that kind of success. Right? And so you, so it's some, but, but those people exist. Now the reason that obesity is a chronic disease, and again, we won't have time to speak about this in detail now, is we kind of understand the molecular biology of obesity in the sense of how the body regulates its energy balance. And often when you hear the example of, well, you know, this is just calories in, calories out. If you eat less than or burn more, then really your weight should change. Uh, that's physics. We're dealing with physiology. And the problem with physiology is that when you try to make a change to caloric intake or make a change to caloric output, your physiology is going to respond. Your physiology is going to try to defend that body weight and will counteract whatever it is that you're trying to do. So what happens when you exercise is you work up an appetite. When you go on a diet and don't eat, you feel hungry. That is a normal response and it's a very complex response that's designed to defend your body weight. And it's highly effective and as we now know, that is a response that does not go away. So if you take someone who's had bariatric surgery, for example, who loses 100 pounds and keeps 100 pounds off for 10 years, if you go back and undo the surgery, that person will put the weight, you know, six months the weight's back, right? So you haven't actually changed or you haven't actually cured obesity. It's an effective treatment, but the treatment only works as long as it works or as long as the patient does it. And that's why this is a chronic disease. Now what this means for us, thinking about obesity as a chronic disease, is that anything that's a quick fix, anything that's an extreme you know, change. So I'm going to start, you know, I'm going to get a gym membership and a personal trainer who costs me 500 bucks a month and I'm going to really work hard and try to get the weight down because I've seen people on The Biggest Loser do this. That kind of approach doesn't work because the only way to keep the weight off you know, is to continue working with Jillian Michael. She comes to your home every day and she trains you for the rest of your life. That's the only way that you'll ever keep that weight off, right? Because nobody can keep doing six hours of exercise with a personal chef for the rest of your life, but that's exactly what it's going to take to keep the weight off. So quick fix solutions don't work and anything that's unsustainable and not feasible is not an option. And that is a very important concept in terms of care delivery. Like when people tell me, oh, we've got a six week program for obesity. I said, yeah, that's great. Or what happens in week seven? Oh, now we have a 12 week program. Okay, fine. What, what, what happens in week 14? No, it's a one year program. Oh, that's great. And what happens in the second year? Right? So the, the whole concept of having a time limited program intervention for obesity makes no sense because you don't do that for chronic diseases. Chronic diseases are lifelong. But you don't go and see a diabetes educator once and that's it. Now you've learned everything about, you know, HbA1c7, you're done, you're good. You know, if there's a problem, call me. It's not how you manage diabetes, right? And so in terms of dealing with obesity as a chronic problem, you have to change your thinking around systems, right? It's, it's CDM. And because it's CDM, all principles of CDM apply to obesity. Everything from patient education, self-management, how do you deal with the patient, how do you set up appointments, how do you do follow-ups. Uh, everything you do for chronic disease management immediately applies itself to obesity because it is a chronic condition. And so that's the first principle. So principle number one in obesity management, you're dealing with a chronic lifelong condition for which we don't have a cure. We've got different management strategies. All those management strategies only work as long as the patient stays in treatment. First principle. Second principle. And the second principle is about improving health and well-being rather than simply focusing on numbers on a scale. So as health professionals, our main interest, of course, is improving health. Well, we've got a patient with health problems and we want to make that person healthier. That is a very different focus than saying, you know, we're focusing on a weight problem where you say, well, I've got a heavy patient and I want to make him lighter. That's what you do when you run a weight loss clinic. Well, that's what people come for, that's what they pay for, that's what they want. They want weight loss. Obesity management is not necessarily about weight loss, and I'll talk about that in a second. What we're really interested in is improving their overall health and well-being. And there's lots of data showing that as people get bigger, 
they have more and more health problems and excess weight has a significant impact on their quality of life and well-being. Those are the things we want to fix. Okay. Now the good news here is that many of those things can be fixed with almost no weight loss or very little weight loss. A 5% weight loss, which for a 300 pound person is 15 pounds, so leaves them at 285, can have a profound impact on the HbA1c. HbA1c can go from 12 to 7. Blood pressure can get better. Every pound of weight that you lose will take four pounds off your knee, each knee at every step. Huge impact on, uh, on, on pain. So when you start addressing some of the underlying problems of the patients, you know, which could be anything from depression to anxiety disorder, mental health problems, body image issues, whatever. They start eating better, they start sleeping better, their self-esteem improves, uh, their motivation improves, their physical activity levels improve. You're going to see a huge impact on health, but you might see very little or almost no impact on the scale. And so if your focus is going to be on the scale, you might very easily conclude, well, this whole obesity thing is not working. Like but you'd be totally wrong because it is working because every other measure of health that you're looking at is really getting better in these patients. The only thing that hasn't changed is the number on the scale. So it's important to remember conceptually that you're not designing a program to change numbers on the scale. You're designing a program to improve health. And that's important to conceptualize as you think about what is obesity management. And this is even more important to recognize because we're not just dealing with a chronic condition. We're dealing with a condition that left untreated in most people will get worse. For most people, obesity is a chronic progressive condition. Now what does that mean? That means if you do nothing, if you just watch and wait, people will just continue to gain, gaining weight or will continue developing health problems. And you just wait long enough, that'll happen. So if you see a patient, you know, you've just been seeing this patient every year for the last five years, and every time you see the patient, you know, he's up five pounds or 10 pounds. Now, this is a patient who's progressively gaining weight. Now, if you intervene with this patient and you can, you know, figure out what is going on, why is this patient gaining weight, and what lifestyle changes can this patient make, and you do all of that, and in the next year, your patient will only have gained two and a half pounds. So for the first time in five years, now in six years, your patient has actually gone through the entire year gaining only two and a half pounds instead of the five pounds he was gaining before. You've actually cut progression in half. Had you done this five years ago, you would have, uh, you would have prevented a very significant amount of weight gain. If you can just stable, weight stabilize, so you have a patient who's been gaining five pounds every year, last 10 years and from now on this patient is not gaining weight anymore right you're 300 pounds today 10 years from now you're still only 300 pounds no weight loss most patients to achieve that would have to make huge changes in their diet and lifestyle because otherwise they would just keep going right so your first sign of success in obesity management is when you start slowing the rate of weight gain and that is and that is your first sign of success which means that successful obesity management does not require weight loss. Because if I can just keep my 300 pound patient at 300 pound and prevent a 50 pound weight gain, hey, that's pretty successful obesity management. Now it is not successful weight loss. If I was running a weight loss center, I'd be out of business. Where nobody would pay me to help them not gain weight. But I don't care because I'm not in a weight loss business and I'm not running a weight loss center. I'm running an obesity clinic where my first goal, as we have in any chronic disease, is to halt progression. If I've got a patient who's losing kidney function, we got to slow that down. I've got a patient who's uh, having arthritis. I want to slow down the progression of arthritis. And in obesity, we want to start by slowing the rate of weight gain. That is one of the most common mistakes we make in weight management. We take someone who's gaining weight and try to turn them into a loser without A, having figured out why they're gaining weight in the first place, and even waiting to see whether we've addressed the problem that was causing the weight gain, can we even weight stabilize? So you have people coming in, they're putting on five pounds every year, and 
we want to lose 50 pounds and we jump right into it. And, and we've completely skipped that step where we say, okay, no, 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 hang on a second. You know, let's, let's start on looking at what is actually causing weight gain. And let's address that first. And how do we know that's working? Well, we'll know that's when you address what causes weight gain, you stop weight gain. That's how you know it's working. Okay. All right. Now, the importance of getting in early is, as I've already mentioned, is your body defends its body weight. And it tends to defend whatever your highest body weight is. So if you have a body weight of, say, 300 pounds, your brain thinks 300 pounds is what I need to protect. Now you go out and do your diet and exercise, your brain thinks, oh, there's something going on. I need to get back to 300 pounds. And it won't rest till it gets you back to 300 pounds. Right? That's, how, that's the way this physiology is designed. And again, I, like I said, that's a special topic. We can, we can talk about the, you know, why that happens and why that is a one-way street. But the point here is that when you wait for somebody to be 300 pounds and leave enough time, that's now their new weight. That's their new normal. And anything that you're going to do now, you're working from 300 pounds. Had you gone in and started doing something at 250, well then 250 would have been their normal. And had you gone in at 200, well then 200 would have been their normal. Right? So the longer you wait before you get in, the more you're going to have problems getting paper down to anywhere close to where you want. Because they're going, you're pulling on this rubber band that's always going to try to go back to the highest weight they have. So the higher the weight, the greater problem you're going to have. What's also important here is, of course, is the fact that when you start doing weight loss, because your body is defending its weight and you're pulling on this rubber band, anytime you do weight loss, and it doesn't matter how you do it, you're actually fighting your body. But you're doing something to your body that your body does not want to do. Because your body thinks this is where I need to be, and you're, and you're trying to get it down here. You're fighting. Right? That is a daily battle that you're going to have with your body trying to get it down to where it is that you want. When you prevent weight gain, you're not fighting anybody. You're supporting your body. Because my body wants to be 300 pounds. If you support me in being 300 pounds, easy. You're helping me. You're doing exactly what my brain wants to do. So there's very little effort involved in trying to get people to sustain weight. But there's a lot of effort required in getting people to lose weight and keep it off. Okay. So, don't wait for people to gain weight. And we have a lot of clinical situations, again a topic we could talk about, where you can predict weight gain, where you know exactly this patient is going to have a weight problem, either because I'm starting them on a certain medication, or I know this patient is now has a lot of stressors, or the relationship's breaking up, or the patient has you know, got osteoarthritis, or whatever. There are a lot of situations where you can predict that people are going to probably have a weight problem. You're much better off trying to prevent that, right? Because in prevention, you're not pulling on that string, right? You're just going to try to address it and try to maybe limit the amount of weight gain. So that's, a, that's another important principle. So looking for the root cause, addressing those as early as possible. Defining success, very frustrating. Because everybody wants to define the success of obesity management on, based on body weight, right? Because everybody confuses an obesity program with a weight loss program. So if I was running a weight loss program, my outcome is body weight, right? If this was a weight loss clinic, then you'd be paying me so that you can lose weight. And if you lose weight, you're successful. And if you're not losing weight, well, then it's a waste of time, okay? So really, it's important to make that distinction. Are you in the obesity management business or are you in the weight loss business? They're not the same. The approaches are different. And the outcomes that you're going to measure are different. Because if my outcome is, if my principal aim is to improve health, which is why I'm doing it, but my, measure of outcome, my outcome measure has to be health. And weight is not health. I can think of a lot of situations where somebody's weight might actually be going up, but they're getting healthier. I can think of a lot of people who are losing weight and getting unhealthy. Right? So simply stepping, stepping on the scales, oh, I gained four pounds, I must be getting sicker. That's not how this works. Right? So what you, if you actually want to know if your face is getting healthy, you've got to have a health outcome that you're measuring. And that's where things get complicated. Because as I said, this is a very heterogeneous condition. If you take our patient, our patient we've got 1,000 pati you know, patients in the clinic, and I'm going to measure HbA1c levels on everybody, and then we're going to look at the end of the year, well, how, many, how much has that gone down? What do you think would happen to HbA1c levels if I measure them in everybody? 
Not much. Why not? Because most patients in the clinic have normal HbA1c levels. It's only about 20 to 30 percent of my patients will even have diabetes and elevated HbA1c. The other 70 percent, their HbA1c's are perfectly fine. They can lose whatever weight they want. Nothing's going to happen to their HbA1c levels. So measuring HbA1c on everybody makes no sense, right? But it'll make sense measuring HbA1c's on people who have elevated HbA1c. Well, those will get better. Blood pressure is going to get better in whom? People who have high blood pressure. Dyslipidemia will get better in who? People who have dyslipidemia. Back pain will get better in patients with back pain. Sleep apnea will get better in people who have sleep apnea. Right? What this means is that if you're going to look at success in a program, you have to individualize your measure of success based on what the problem is that you're trying to solve. And that is going to be different in different people. Her HbA1c is going to get better, your back pain is going to get better, your cholesterol will get better, and you're going to have less problem with sleep apnea. Those are four different outcomes. Right? And I can get all of those outcomes probably with no weight change or very little weight change. Right? And so in, in, in measuring the success of your program, if you're not going to use weight and don't use weight because that's not the best, it's, it's, it's not a sensible measure to use. You have to actually look at what's the problem, is it getting better? And that makes analysis of effectiveness very, very complicated, right? Because there's not one thing I can measure that's going to tell me whether this is working. Okay? Because it could be self-esteem. Hey, I haven't lost weight, but now that my self-esteem is so much better, I feel so much better about myself, now I leave the house, I, I've, I've joined curves, I'm doing exercise programs, I've got my energy back, I haven't lost weight, but you know what, I don't care anymore. Right, because my self-esteem has gotten so much better. Okay, and in fact, I've gained four pounds, but I don't care. Right, that's a much healthier person now, but nothing's happened to weight. Okay, so it's important. So, what are you going to measure as success of your program? And then ultimately, a lot of people are still in their minds have this concept of ideal weight, which means okay, if I don't get people down to their BMI of whatever 24, 25, well then they're not at goal. Okay, where did this goal come from? So, again, this is a topic we can talk about. But where did this idea come from that there's an ideal weight? What does that actually mean? Does it even apply? Is there even data to support it? And what should be goals? Should we even have weight goals? Is that even what we you know, weight is not what we are focusing on. Well, then sh should that even be a goal? And we'll talk about that in a second, right? And it's not about what the theoretical goal is. If I take someone who's BMI 45, say, yeah, you have to have a BMI of 25. Well, you can go and shoot yourself because that won't happen. Right? It's not even a realistic goal. Not even with bariatric surgery do you stand, stand a good chance of getting there. So why would that even be a goal? And that's where the concept of best weight came in. To say, but I don't care what ideal weight is. What I care about is, are you at the best weight that you can be at and sustain while still enjoying a good quality of life and not doing crazy stuff. Now, yeah, now you might be able to sustain a 100 pound weight gain by doing three and a half hours of exercise every day and living off 1200 calories. You might be able to do it. But do you enjoy doing that? And is that something you can see yourself doing for the rest of your life? Because if not, then I don't know how you're going to keep that weight off. Because eventually you're not going to exercise three hours more, you'll be doing two hours and right away the weight's starting to come back. Okay, so best weight means figuring out what is, the, what is the right weight for a patient to be at given their circumstances, their age, their comorbidities, their medications, their psychosocial stuff, their whatnot. And so this whole topic of best weight is something we could talk about. We can spend an hour talking about how do you define best weight, how do you measure it, where do you, how do you get there, and what does it actually mean. Okay. So those are your principles. So you got the principle of the chronic disease. Uh, it's not about losing weight, it's about improving health. Uh, don't watch and wait, because the longer you wait, the more difficult this is going to be. Uh, we don't, defining success is not, by, is not defining success based on a weight measure, but on a health measure. And ultimately, as your overall target is trying to find the patient's best weight and not trying to push them to their ideal weight which they will, most people will be unlikely to A, get there, B, sustain, even if they got there for a day. Okay, so those are the five principles. All right, so these are 
the philosophies that underlie the whole five A's program. And as you've said, I mean, it, you know, I've already told you, you know, probably 10 things that are different from the way that obesity is currently being managed, not just in primary care, anywhere. Okay. So, where, so the five A's. Now, you, you, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the five A's in other contexts. There's five A's of smoking cessation, there's five A's of pain management, there's five A's of physical activity, there's lots of different five A's. The reason we took the five A's is because we, we were looking for some, some way to make this, uh, to show a pathway. Now, we started with a lot of other things. We had algorithms, you know, where you have boxes, say, if, if yes here, if no there. Uh, by the time you get to the third or fourth box, you're now working in like 12 dimensional space. It doesn't work anymore. Uh, we looked at EMR programs. The problem there is it's not standardized. Everybody's using different EMRs, so and you'd have to, you know, program the system for every different type of EMR. And even there, it's not it's not easy and straightforward to do. And so we said, okay, let's 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 not micromanage this. Let's get into some basic principles here, and you know, have a sort of a sort of a guideline that 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 doesn't exactly dictate what happens in each of those, but again sets up certain principles that will underlie the five A's. And so I'll take you through those. Uh, and the first one that came up, and we heard this consistently from patients, and we heard it consistently from, uh, 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 from some providers, saying that, you know, we need to, this is a very sensitive topic. And if you jump in there, now in smoking cessation, you ask people, well, do you smoke? Now it's not a good idea to ask somebody, you know, who's overweight, well, you know, you have a weight problem. Now, of course, they have a weight problem. They know they have a weight problem. And some people might think they have a weight problem and they don't have a weight problem, but it's not the best way to jump into that conversation. So the whole ask idea is, is really to remind yourself that this is a sensitive topic. And so when you approach the topic with your patient, it's really important to not to be judgmental. Providence for change. You can use different techniques for doing that. And you can signal your friendliness by the environment in which you're doing this. So not being judgmental is key. And it's, it's probably, if, if you do nothing else for your obese patient, it's taking judgment out of it. Don't make assumptions. Don't think, oh, there's a fat guy, he's probably eating junk food all the time, never moves off the couch. Because that might not at all be the case. Don't assume your patient has no motivation to lose weight when in fact your patient has actually lost 60 pounds. Right, or, or had bariatric surgery. You just didn't know that because you didn't, you, you just assumed, right? Uh, don't pretend that this is going to be easy, okay? It's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard. And it's going to be lifelong. And it's not going to be a quick fix and there's not going to be a solution, okay? So you pretending that this is going to be easy, you know, just do a little few things, small changes, big effects, and all, it's all nonsense, right? Nobody believes that. It's not true. Don't say it, okay? If you can just acknowledge that your patient is up against a huge challenge, and that we don't have good treatments for this, and the best we can do is try to manage the situation for this patient, and perhaps worst case scenario, you know, they stay the way they are now, but hopefully they'll be healthier, uh, you'll have patients break down and cry in front of you because that's not what they're hearing. What they're hearing is someone telling them, you know, you've got to lose 60 pounds before I'll do your hip. That's what your patients are hearing, right? So this sentence alone right away changes your relationship to the patient. And the, and the patient says, oh, wow, here's somebody who actually understands, you know, how difficult this is going to be. You've got to be ready for change. Now, there's nothing different about readiness for change in the concept of obesity than anywhere else in the clinic. Right? If a patient is not ready, then you need to get them there. And there are ways of doing that. You can use motivational interviewing as a standard technique, moving people along the pathway. Sample questions, how do you start a conversation? We can do little workshops on this. What's the language that you use? There's been research on this. Uh, the terminology, how do you present it? How do you do this? How do you actually interact with the patient to bring up the topic? And how do you demonstrate uh, a weight-friendly practice? And it starts with the magazines that you have lying in the waiting room, what's running on the TV monitor, uh, where's your scale, where's your, you know, you, you know all of those things uh, become important in, uh, in just signaling to the patient, I understand your problems, I understand what you need, and we are prepared for this, okay? It's just part of being professional. 
especially given the uh, especially given the fact that you know 20 30 percent of your patients are going to be in this category where they actually have special needs because of their size so that's the ask and the ask is all about sensitivity right it's all about signaling that you understand your patient and know what they're up against the second point that we heard from a lot of patients and this is different from 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 smoking cessation smoking cessation you ask if somebody's smoking then you advise them that it's not good for you end of story this is a very different story here over here we heard from patients consistently you know please don't give me any advice before you know what the problem is in fact don't give me any advice before you know what my problem is right and if you think about it well that's true like I mean if you know nothing about me and you don't know what my possible problem is well what advice are you going to give me you're going to give me advice that is either completely generic which means it's useless or it's going to be based on assumptions that you're making about me and my health and my needs and my goals uh, so really if you haven't done the assessment you're in no position to give me any kind of advice right and that's why in the obesity management we flipped we flipped the advice from the uh, 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 in, in smoking cessation is the ask is do you smoke you say yes my advice is you need to stop okay easy obesity management is different right I'm going to ask for permission is it okay to talk about your vague patient says yeah so okay, that's great let's do some tests let's try to figure out what the problem is so what do you look for well what you're looking for is assessing obesity class and stage I'll talk about that you're looking for those drivers why is this person gaining weight what's going on here what are the complications what are the barriers and what is possibly the root causes of weight gain in this patient and so again this is this is this this is a topic we could spend an hour on this uh, not on this part this part is easy this part is you you get measure you know height and weight and you get the BMI and there's a number and that number tells you how big your patient is well that number does not tell you BMI does not tell you how sick your patient is so we actually had to come up with a whole different score of trying to figure out well how sick is my patient because you can have patients who have BMIs of 30 and have no problems right so technically they're obese they're class 1 obesity but there's nothing right they're healthy blood pressure is normal triglycerides are normal everything's fine that's stage zero then you can have people who have preclinical problems so if you look hard enough you'll find something's wrong with them uh, that's preclinical which was a pre-diabetes pre-hypertension snoring it's not quite sleep apnea you've got some heartburn it's not quite reflux occasional stuff then you've got the established comorbidities those are your patients who now have diabetes have dyslipidemia have fatty liver disease whatever <coughs> you can have end organ damage from those conditions so it's not just diabetes but now you've got retinopathy and nephropathy and neuropathy and then you can have end stage patients right so that's the Edmonton obesity staging system again we can spend a whole day talking about this um, how do you assess the patient how do you classify the patient what do you look at what do you not look at and uh, it's important because we've actually shown that it is this stage that determines the patient's risk which is of course logical that someone who has end organ damage is going to be worse than someone who doesn't irrespective of what their BMI actually is right? so your initial assessment is going to be BMI and the next step now what you can also do is waist circumference and again we can talk about waist circumference what's the use why do you do it why do you not do it what does it tell you or not tell you we can talk about that but ultimately your risk and clinical decisions are probably going to be here and your outcomes if you want to measure health outcomes are also probably going to be in that in that topic of EOS assessment so what else are you looking for so now that we know how big the patient is what else do you need to know well you need to answer three questions you want to know well why is this patient big how is their weight affecting their health and what are the likely barriers to treatment and to assess those three things or answer those three questions you do what we have called the four M's now a lot of the information in the four M's you guys will be collecting anyway you might just not be doing this order but it doesn't matter it's, it's a conceptual framework and the four M's are mental health, mechanical health, metabolic health, and monetary health. Or as the French guys now say, they've, they've coined this as the word milieu. So it stands for social health. Now why is this important? So first of all, mental health. Uh, the importance of mental health is because almost every mental health problem you can think of can either promote weight gain, 
sometimes they can be consequences of excess weight. In almost every case, they're going to be major barriers to treatment. It's not impossible. We just had a New England Journal paper that showed that even in patients who've got significant mental health problems, you can get significant weight management. But it's challenging and it's going to be much more difficult. And it doesn't matter what the problem is. This could be depression, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, attention deficit, you name it. Okay? So you've got to recognize that right away you've got a different problem with this patient. All the mechanical problems, these are consequences of being large. Everything from sleep apnea, osteoarthritis, chronic pain, thrombosis, reflux disease, urinary incontinence, you name it. Right? Many of these problems can promote weight gain. Think about this, think of sleep apnea. Uh, they can be causes of excess weight and they can be barriers to treatment. Again, think sleep apnea, think arthritis, think urinary incontinence. Right? Those can be significant barriers to management. We've got all of the metabolic problems with obesity. You've got type 2 diabetes, you've got gout, you've got fatty liver disease, you've got polycystic ovary syndrome, you've got dyslipidemia, gallbladders, whatnot. Right? All of this stuff. And again, some of them can provide weight gain, some of them can be consequences, and they can be barriers to treatment. Now remember, the medications you use here, where well, there should really be, be a fifth M, which is medications, because a lot of medications that are used here can be part of the problem. They can cause weight gain, or they can be barriers to weight treatment. And ultimately, you've got the whole social aspect here. Not having enough money can cause weight gain. You can lose your job because you're too big. And if the treatment is going to cost you 5,000 bucks a month, well, maybe you can't afford it, right? So I need to have all of this information on my patient before I can even think about coming up with a treatment and management plan. Right? And I still haven't asked, what do you have for breakfast and how much do you exercise? Those to me are completely secondary questions. Right? Those are questions that are irrelevant if the patient has got a significant mental health issue that I need to deal with, I don't care what he's having for breakfast. This is the problem here that needs to be solved first. Right? I'm glad he's even having breakfast. I don't care what it is. Right? So that's why this is your basic assessment. Now, once you have that information, and in primary care, you often have that information because it's your patient. You're not seeing the patient for the first time. You can take this and put this into a framework of trying to understand what's the problem. And again, this would take like an hour and a half to go through. Right? Basic principles of thinking work. Let's, let's think about what's actually causing the problem, what are the barriers, how does this work. So you've done your assessment. Okay. Next step. Well, now I know what the problem is. I can start giving you some advice. Okay. What can I tell you about? I can talk to you about your obesity risks. I know what stage you're at. I know what comorbidities you have. I need to make sure you understand the benefits of modest weight loss. In fact, you need to understand that this is an obesity program, not a weight loss program. You need to understand the need for long-term treatment. This is all patient education stuff. And here are the treatment options you need to look at and think about. Okay? My advice to you. Okay. What are the treatment options? Well, the first thing we need to realize, and a lot of people get very disappointed here, is that diet and exercise on average will get you 3 to 5% of initial weight. Okay? That's the best evidence. And, these, and, and those numbers come from volunteer studies done at the best centers, usually academic centers, who've got everybody, they've got their multidisciplinary team, they've got the exercise physiologists and the psychologists and the whatnot, and they do that. And then you look at their results over a two-year, three-year period, if you get an average weight loss of 3%, you're doing pretty good. Weight-wise average is about 4%. And we've got everything, right? Very disappointing, right? We don't have pharmacotherapy. The next best thing then is, in Canada right now, would be surgery. Surgery gets you about 20 to 30% weight loss, right? So we, here we've got diet and exercise that gives you about 5% weight loss, and then we've got surgery that gives you you know, 25 to 30 percent weight loss. In between, there isn't much. That's where normally we would have pharmacotherapy for obesity, which we currently don't have. Okay, but that's important to remember because if this is a patient that you know is not a patient that you're going to send for surgery, well then, don't give him a 20 percent weight loss goal because there's no way that he's ever going to get there. Right. So, if you tell a patient you need to lose 20 percent of your body weight, you need to lose 40 pounds you need to end the sentence by saying, here's your referral to the surgeon. 
because that's the only way you'll ever get there. Unless you maybe you're one of the 20, you know, strange people. So that's really hard for these Very. that are told by orthopedic surgeons. We got a huge education job to do, but not just amongst our orthopedic surgeons. I think, I think a lot of people. Okay, but that's what you need to understand. Now, here are the things we can talk about, and these are the options. And again, you know, we can spend a lot of time talking about these things. Uh, the first one, which is always forgotten, is sleep time and stress management. Every patient will tell you that they know what to do, and the only reason they can't do it is because they don't have the time. They're too stressed out, and they're too exhausted. Well, one of the most common reasons that they were exhausted is because they're not sleeping enough. Stress management, we all have that problem. Time management. So, really, if you don't have the time to eat healthy, well, then me talking to you about healthy eating is a waste of my time and yours. Right? So, let's find that time first. So, so time management is often one of the first things. I can tell you right off the bat, if, you, if you're planning to have bariatric surgery, you're going to spend 90 minutes eating every single day for the rest of your life. But that's lo how long it's going to take you to eat once you have had bariatric surgery. If you cannot make 90 minutes a day to eat your meals, don't have bariatric surgery. Don't do it. Okay? Nobody thinks of these things. Nobody talks about them. Right? If you're not sleeping, the last thing I would want you to see you do is get up an hour earlier to go for a run. You don't need an hour of exercise. You need an extra hour of sleep. Okay, very different concepts, right? Stress management. If you don't have a handle of stress and you're a stress eater, emotional eater, nothing that I can tell you is going to work until we get a good handle on your stress. You don't need to see a dietitian. You don't need to see anybody. It's going to be stress management here. Okay. We don't. How many of you talk about time, stress, and sleep? Okay. Very good. Sleep is slowly finding its way into this whole thing. Dietary interventions. This is what the dietitian does. Talk about dietitian. We talk about patterns, nutritional hygiene, what do you eat, when do you eat, how do you eat. That's dietitian stuff. Great. If that's what you need to know, now it's time to see a dietitian. Okay? Physical activity. The consensus on physical activity right now is that this is not about that this is not the most efficient way to lose weight. In fact, the largest randomized controlled trials show virtually no dose-response relationship between the amount of exercise you do and the amount of weight you lose. In fact, if you do excessive amounts of exercise, your weight might actually go up. Why does that happen? Well, first of all, exercise helps you work up an appetite, right? And then you overcompensate. So yeah, I burned 200 calories here, so now I'll have 300 calories to reward myself. But it doesn't work. It turns out that maybe the main reason that exercise actually does work for weight management is not what it does to your calories out, but probably what it does to your calories in. Because when you exercise, you tend to have a routine. You tend to feel better about yourself. It's a great way of managing stress. It improves your mood. It improves your sleep. It improves your self-esteem. You feel so much better. I don't need that chocolate cake anymore. Right? So it's really the impact that physical activity has on your energy intake that is probably more important and probably the reason why people who exercise regularly do a much better job of keeping weight off and managing their weight than people who don't, not because they're burning calories, but because it has all of these positive benefits that are ultimately going to affect energy in. I'm not saying that there's no benefits of being physically active. Of course there are. You know, physical fitness, it improves insulin sensitivity, it does, you know, prevents cancer, improves your mood, does a million things, right? But if your focus is, okay, weight loss, I'm going to start exercising because I need to lose weight, which is what everybody tells you, that's nonsense, right? That is, a, that is a rumor that the fitness industry wants to sell you, but there's no evidence that, that that's actually the primary goal, or that's the primary way it works. Psych psychology. So psychology... I don't know how you would run an obesity center without psychology and psychiatry, right? Because as I said, the first M of obesity management is mental health. Not because every obese person got a mental health problem, but because mental health issues are so common and are so common barriers to weight management that if you don't address them, you're not going to get anywhere. So knowing that not all of you are mental health specialists, 
Your job is to identify those problems and move those patients to the right service. So you can send them all to the dietitian. What's the dietitian going to do? No, you need to first go to the psychologist, deal with the issues, get better, then go see the dietitian. Okay, so it's a lot of sequencing. Low calorie diets, they've got a very special indication. Again, you can spend a whole day talking about where and why and when you would do them. Obesity medications we don't have. Bariatric surgery we've already talked about. If you think this patient needs to lose 15% of their body weight, you might as well start bringing up the topic of surgery. And I can tell you most patients don't want to hear about it. Right? Because surgery is the position, it's the last thing you do, it's what you do when everything else fails, it's like a desperate measure. Yeah, that used to be bariatric surgery 20 years ago. Today you're talking about a very, very sophisticated, very low risk type of operation where it's nothing like surgery was 10 years ago or 15 years ago when you would cut people open, go through 14 inches of fat and you'd have all kinds of problems. Uh, today, bariatric surgery is a, is a very sophisticated procedure that's done, but it's not just about the surgery. It works the best when you do this as part of a chronic disease management program and that's how it needs to be done. Okay, but you might as well talk about it. Okay, so now we've talked about it. Very shocking to the patient, heard lots of things that they weren't expecting still has completely unrealistic ideas about where they will go with their, uh, with their weights. And so now you need to talk about things, right? Talk about weight loss expectations. This is important. You all do SMART goals, right? What's a SMART goal for weight loss? There is no SMART goal for weight loss. Why? Because SMART goals are for behaviors and weight loss is not a behavior. Smoking cessation is a behavior. When I stop putting a cigarette in my mouth and inhaling, I've changed the behavior. I've stopped doing something. Losing weight is not a behavior. Now I can do things that may or may not result in eating breakfast is a behavior. Keeping a food diary is a behavior. Walking 10,000 steps a day is a behavior. Getting an extra hour of sleep is a behavior. Counting calories is a behavior. Those are behaviors. Losing weight is not a behavior. When I tell someone to stop smoking, they know exactly what to do. When I tell somebody to lose weight, they have no idea. Like they'll probably go off and exercise. Right? So it's not a behavioral goal because you have not prescribed a behavior that your patient now needs to change. You've just told them, go lose weight. That's like telling a patient, you know what? I need you to go out there and get heart healthy. Come back. Right? Once you're really healthy, great. And I'm not telling you what to do. Right? So, because weight loss is not a behavior, it cannot be a behavioral goal. Only behaviors can be behavioral goals. And so, you cannot have a smart goal for weight loss. Because all you can measure are behaviors. If my behavior goal is to have breakfast, when I start having breakfast, I've changed my behavior and I have successful behavior change. Is that going to change my body weight? I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. Right? When I start walking 10,000 steps, I've changed my behavior and I'm successful because I'm now working 10,000 steps. Does that mean I'm losing weight? No. Maybe yes, maybe no. Right? So I cannot measure behavior change based on something that may or may not happen. I can only measure behavior change on whether or not behaviors change. Fundamental thing. So you cannot have weight goals. You cannot have a smart goal. Losing five pounds in the next four weeks is not a smart goal. It's a nonsense goal. Starting to eat breakfast twice a week over the next four weeks, that's a behavioral goal. That I can do, that I can measure, and if I'm doing that, I'm successful. Okay? It's fundamental. You cannot have a smart weight goal. Now let's talk treatments. Well, it needs to be realistic and sustainable. I don't care what other people can do. All I care about what can you do. Given your situation, your age, your chronic pain, your sleep apnea, all those medications you're on, here's what I think you can do. Here's somebody else that can do something else. Right? Highly individualized. You gotta address those drivers. Otherwise we're just you know, we're just doing pain management, we're not addressing what's causing the pain. Right? Success we're gonna measure in quality of life, improvement energy levels, sleep, 
improvements in HbA1c, blood pressure, medications, whatever, anything but your weight. Okay. The reason that we measure your weight is because if your weight is still going up, then maybe there's still stuff here that we haven't found and that we haven't addressed. Okay. All right. Now that we've agreed on this, it's time to start doing something. And that's where assistance comes in. And what do we do? You identify those barriers. Let's go back and address them. This is chronic disease management. You're going to be living with obesity ever. You can be, there's only one type of, there's only two types of obese patients, treated and untreated. But you're, you're obese for life. Okay, so you better learn about this. And you better understand what you're up against and how to manage it, right? This is a lifelong diagnosis, not going anywhere. And you've got to see the right provider at the right time. You need to see the psychologist, you need to see the pharmacist, exercise specialist, psychiatrist, pain guy, sleep doctor, orthopedic surgeon. It's going to be very different for different patients because they have different problems that need to be solved. Right? If you send everybody, let's send everybody to the dietitian first, you're wasting the dietitian's time. Right? Some of those patients you can help, many of them So what am I going to do? Right? It's not my area of expertise. Right? You got to see them again. Question always about how often do I need to see them? I don't know. How often do you see your diabetic patients? Well, some guys you see once a year, some guys you see every six months, some people you see once a month, some people you see once a week, whatever it takes, right? There's no rule that every obese patient has to be seen in the clinic at least every four weeks. That's nonsense. Right? Some guys you might have to see once a week and some guys you'll see every three months and some guys you'll say, okay, come back next year. That depends entirely on the patient and on how they're doing, right? But you've got to see them again, right? You cannot oh, successfully treat your discharge from my practice. Don't, don't come back till there's a problem. That's not how you manage it, okay? All right, so we've done this, education, appropriate provider, follow-up, and so that you go around in circles, right? Now, the good news is you don't do all of these circles at every visit or at one visit, right? I'm going to ask this visit, and you say yes, okay, great, then you come back for an assessment, and maybe we want to do the full assessment, we'll do some of the assessment. Once we've done assessment, I'm going to start giving you some advice, and then we'll agree on this part of the plan, and then maybe we'll start with that, and then we'll keep going. Right? It's not a, it's not, it's not a, okay, we got to do this whole, I don't have time for this. No, asking can take, what, 40 seconds, right? So, it's a continuous process of improvement of chronic disease management. All right, now I just want to finish up by taking you through the package. Just tell you what, what's in there. If you just give me one example, I'll just wrap up. So a couple of things in there. So you've, you've, seen the, you've seen the little booklet. That's everything I talked about. Uh, at the back last page, there's a bunch of resources. There's some literature here. But there's also, what's important, a whole bunch of websites that provide more professional information on the topics that I've talked about. Okay? So they're in this. Okay, what else do we have? We've got this little thing here which is not a cube, that's a dodecahedron, 12 sides. Don't put it together now, uh, because it doesn't come apart easily. And, re and read the instructions which are on the back on how to put it together so it doesn't fall apart. But once you have it together, it's pretty stable and can sit on your table forever. Uh, it's a nice little conversation starter and it's something that just kind of reminds you of the order and if you're not quite sure what needs to be done at each A, well, it's okay. So it's one of those things you just put them together. It's some craft works just before Halloween. Here's a checklist. I don't know if you need, it depends on, on how you function in your clinic, whether you, if it's all electronic, then you probably don't want paper-based checklists. If you do want paper-based checklists, then this is a checklist. What's important on the back of the checklist is, again, just as a reminder, some of the information that was in the presentation. So here, again, is body mass index, Edmonton staging system, here are the four M's, and here's the, here's the etiological framework, right? Just as a reminder. Oh, sorry. Then we've got the, the piece which is, this is a consumable, 
these you these if you're using these you'll probably need to reorder them soon because I go through a lot of these uh, it's a tear-off it's a pad with tear-off sheets that on front has the five obesity facts we talked about now in lay language right so it doesn't say obesity is a chronic disease what it says is obesity requires long-term solutions which is the same thing it just sounds different okay we do use the word obesity because we do want patients to understand that they are up against a medical condition that is called obesity, right? It's not a, it's not a four letter word. Now, part of how you say it and how you present to the patient and the language you use, don't call people obese. And there are ways of doing this and there's techniques of actually using the word obesity in a clinical conversation without offending the patient. Uh, but in the end it's obesity, okay? That's what you're dealing with. Uh, so here you've got the four, uh, you've got the five principles. Get the patient to read this. What I often do is I take the back side of this, which again has a whole bunch of websites on it, which address, which now have patient information for all of the conditions that we've talked about with the four M's. So if you have a patient who you think has got an eating disorder, there's the eating disorder website. We've got the sleep disorder website, the sleep apnea website, arthritis, chronic pain, incontinence, digestive disease, fatty liver disease, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, what have you. Right? And so you can hand this to the patient and say, here's the couple of websites I want, I want you to check out. And then you can scribble a few more onto this if you want. Right? And so I go through a lot of these. In fact, I go through these even with my non-obese patients just because the information is on the back. So that's in the pad. And then we've got some light reading, which is this little booklet here uh, that a couple of years ago I wrote together with a family doc from Ottawa where we brought everything that I've talked about in principle. This was before we had the five A's. But the principles remain. So you'll see it's, it's absolutely a short compendium of the kind of things that you need to think about dealing with an obese patient. So it's light reading. You can probably go through this book in, in a couple of hours. And you can download it from, uh, uh, from the Obesity Network website. It's this website here. If you're not a member of the Obesity Network, you just might want to sign up because it doesn't cost you anything. It's free. So you just go to this website and sign up. Uh, best way to, well, you can get it, you already have it. And for those who are interested, this is, this is my blog. So if you just Google drsharma.ca or just Dr. Sharma, you'll get my... How many of you have read my blog? Quite a few. Okay, great. Uh, for those of you who don't have never heard about it, if you subscribe, then you get a little email from me every day telling you something about obesity that's going on. Okay, so that's short introduction. Like I said, this was a, this was a high-level view, quick overview over what the 5 A's program is. Each one of those bullet points you can take and, you know move apart because there are lots lots and lots and lots of information in here okay so i'll stop here i'll take a few questions and then maybe we should go for a break any immediate questions practical questions no detailed questions we'll get into those later And that's something we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about. Uh, how do you how do you have that conversation, right? Uh, we don't actually promote calorie counting. We promote calorie awareness, uh, knowing that where calories are, what your approximate count is. But we we can have a special session on that uh, because it's an important topic. I mean, that's that that's the fourth uh, that's the fourth A. Agree. How do you come to an agreement with the patient on what is realistic and what's not realistic? Well, and that might be the A that takes up the most time. Like for them, it's just it's, it's the tangible, right? It's I know yeah. when I've lost 20 pounds, yep. whereas my blood pressure goes down. Well, you make that tangible, right? Right. It's a, and, 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 and so really defining the goals, if you want goals or targets, they need to be health goals, right? We are doing this. Well, look what happened to your HbA1c, look what happened to your triglycerides, look what happened to your cholesterol, look what happened to your back pain, look at your reflux disease, you know, how much pressure could you take off your CPAP machine, energy levels, sleep, there's, there's a million things and you need to focus your conversation on those. Oh, again, there's techniques and there's things we can talk about. Okay? Alright, thank you.